Good morning. Thank you, Lane. We're going to have to get some more young men. Our young men are growing up and leaving. And uh, we got some young men coming on, though. Don't be fearful. I got to mention something. Um, in the last week and a half, we've had five baptisms. Lillian and Cain and David and Tanner and Aubrey have put on Christ. Well, I'm going to tell you, if that isn't something to get excited about, I don't know what is. Thank you. When you work in ministry, as Brother Ty and I do, and Alicia and Amanda, all they're not, although they're not up front. And you spend time with young people, and I know many others in this congregation do as well. These are the, the moments that you cherish. Not just because it is a reward for something that you've spent some time in. I know that's, that's a, a good part of it for us anyway. But that you realize they have made the most important decision that they'll ever make in their life. And as a parent, I can remember how I felt when my children reached that point. I remember how I felt the load that was taken off of me when they reached that point. The relief that I had. And I know many of you as parents probably remember that too and look forward to it. Let's don't take our eye off of that goal. Let's keep it. Let's keep it. As parents, we feel that way because we love them. As ministers, we feel that way about you as a congregation because we love you and we want you to be in heaven. I heard a story about this preacher and he, he's an old preacher and he, he got up preached one Sunday morning and he, uh, he got done with his sermon and he told the congregation, he said, now next week I'm going to preach about the sin of lying. And he said, and in preparation for that I want everybody here to read Mark chapter 17. So a week rolled by, you know, and the preacher, he gets up and he goes to preach his sermon. He said, now, I want to show a hands. I want to know who read Mark chapter 17. Of course, there were several hands went up, you know, sitting back there. He said, all right, then. You realize Mark only has 16 chapters. I will proceed with that sermon online. Well, I'm not going to preach a sermon online this morning, but I am going to preach a sermon on something equally as important. There's a war going on. There's a war going on, and we fight a battle every day as Christians. And it's not a physical war that we can go somewhere and see the battlefield or see the physical results of it, but there's a war going on, and it is a war for your soul and for my soul. And when we talk about the big picture, this is the big picture. And when we talk about where it really gets down to the point where it counts, this is where it goes. I want you to turn with me this morning to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll read a couple of verses there that Lane read for us. We're going to start with verse 10 in Ephesians chapter 6. And the Apostle Paul writing to the church here at Ephesus, he says, um, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now he's trying to encourage these folks. Be strong in the power of His might. Might. You know what that means? That means you can't go alone. 
You've got to lean upon God's power for what you do. You've got to call on Him. You've got to make Him part of your life. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's what we wrestle against. You can't see it. You can't see it, but it's there. And the Apostle Paul makes us aware of it. He says, this is where the real battle lies. Principalities and powers, host of wickedness. Those forces behind the evil that we see every day. You think about that word principalities. Now, that's kind of a word we don't use much every day, but uh, the dictionary is an order of angels, and that even includes fallen angels. The powers of darkness. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against humanity, but against powers that we cannot see. What does it look like? I want to take you back this morning to Job chapter 1. Now, I know there's a lot of you that are students of the book of Job, and it's a long book, and it tells a a story. But it tells a story of what we're talking about today. And if you'll go with me to Job chapter 1 and start with verse 6 there. Now, Job, he was a guy, he had it all. I mean, as far as wealth is concerned, as far as success is concerned if you look at those things as a measure of his success well then you can say Job was successful he was blessed he had everything that he could have wanted physically and excuse me and in verse 6 now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Now that's Satan for you. Scriptures talk about Satan being like a roaring lion, walking about seeking out those he can devour. That's what he's doing here. He's looking for any vulnerable individual to which he can pounce you having a bad day today you're having trouble today he's looking for you he's fixing to get all over you he's fixing to get right up in your business then the Lord said to Satan have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth a blameless and upright man well, wouldn't it be great if we could be called that? I'd love that. I'd love that. If, it, if I could be called that and it be true, if it be true, and it ain't. But think about that compliment the Lord said about Job. That's a, that's a big one. A blameless and an upright man who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job not fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? Around his household and around all that he has on every side, you have blessed his work, the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. principalities and powers. That's what they look like. That's the picture you need to have in your mind of what's going on in this world. It's not a physical picture. 
But physically, physically speaking, Job lost it all pretty much. And if you go ahead and read that book, and you study it a little bit, Job never gave in. He never gave in to those trials and temptations that were put upon him, even to the point that he lost his children. And he's sitting around with sores all over him, scraping himself with a piece of a broken pottery or something. He's down to nothing in this world. And yet he never cursed God. He never said anything bad about God. He took it. How many times do we have to think about that? Am I going to take it? Am I going to take that which is put upon me? Job had a model relationship with God. He was called God's servant. What a compliment. You know God can protect us. And you notice when we read that scripture in Job chapter 1 that there were limits to what Satan could do to him. God put limits on what Satan could do to him. And I think that it is apparent that he can still do that today. That doesn't mean you're not going to be tempted just like Job was. That doesn't mean that the principalities and powers of darkness, the rulers of darkness, are not going to pounce upon you. But there's limits. God places limits on them. God can deliver us from such power. Go with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We'll start at verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Right there it is. And conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. You know Satan uses our sins against us. Has he ever used your sins against you? He'll do it every day if you let him. He'll let it be in your mind that well I'm just not worthy or maybe I can't do that or maybe he'll use that to hold you back in some area of your life when you could excel maybe it's work in the church God forgives sins but that doesn't stop Satan from trying to use them against us in verse 15 of that same chapter He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creations. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. There's that word again, those words again. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Folks, we don't ever need to lose track. We don't ever need to forget who holds the ultimate power in this universe. And I know there's days when we, have, we might question that. And I'm sure when you look at Job's life, there's probably some days there that he was frustrated. Frustrated because we just don't understand We just don't understand why things happen to me. And we look down the neighbor down the road and we see him prosper. Or we see somebody else in our life and we think for some reason that nothing bad ever happens to them. Why does it always have to happen to me? Why does it happen to my family? I can't answer those questions. I don't think Job could answer those questions. But he didn't lose track. He never lost track of who held the power, who was in control. We need to live by the Spirit. We can't live by the physical things in this life. We can't walk in the flesh. We have to get bigger than that as Christians. We have to grow. Are you listening to me this morning? 
We've got to get above that. We've got to learn to walk in the Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, we're going to spend a little time in Romans this morning. Romans chapter 8 is, uh, is one of those places it has got a lot of meat in it. We'll start with verse 5. In Romans chapter 8, verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And I think we're talking about life beyond physical life. We're talking about eternal life and peace found through the Spirit. Where is our mindset? Are we thinking about this one little thing that's causing us problems? Or do we understand the big picture? Do we understand the challenges and why they are there? Do we understand how they make us stronger? What are we focusing on? Is it this world? Is it the flesh? Or is it spiritual in nature? We'll go back to Colossians just for a minute in chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses starting at verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on this earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Seek those things which are above. And Christians, brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a much greater calling we have a much greater future than that physical life that we're now engaged in. It's much bigger than that. There's an eternity. There's an eternity. And you know, when you lay this life we have, this little 70 or 80 years or whatever it is, 90 years, some of it's 100, I'll probably not make that one. When we lay that up against eternity, you can't even see it. I heard an illustration one time that talked about eternity. And this guy was telling a story of a steel ball, a hard steel ball. I want you to picture this in your mind. He said every 10,000 years, this little bird comes down and he wipes his wing on that steel ball. He said, how long would it take that little bird to completely wear that ball away? If he came once every 10,000 years. He said, that's the best illustration I can give you for eternity. And folks, that's not even close. Think about it. You need to get this picture of eternity in your mind. Eternity is forever. It never ends. And what you do in this little old life determines where you're going to spend it. How you live this life determines where you're going to spend it. Don't do anything in this life that's going to jeopardize where your soul spends eternity. It's temporary. This life is temporary. It's only a trial. Job was put through a trial. And if you go to the end of the story, you'll realize really quick that God give it all back to him and then some. And that's in a physical sense. What more can he do for us in an eternal sense? Don't put yourself in jeopardy. Don't let anything become more important to you than your relationship with God. Because that's the only thing that's going to be important when it comes to eternity. Think about it. It's temporary.
Christ was tempted. You can go to read that and you can look at how Christ was tempted in Luke chapter 4. He had his mind on what was important. I want to look at a scripture in Hebrews 4. In Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16, Seeing then that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need or in the time of need. Right after Jesus was baptized, he didn't have no sin, so he just was baptized to fulfill the things that had been spoken. It says in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for forty days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when he had ended, when, it had, when they had ended, he was hungry. I would imagine I'd be hungry too. You know, I I can't imagine eating not eating for 40 days, but Jesus went 40 days. Can you imagine what he might have looked like after that? Can you imagine the physical condition of his body? Satan took upon him that time to tempt him. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus said, saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I'll give you, and all this authority I will give you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you shall worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus said, and Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him, up, then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from, there, from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now listen to this one, verse 13. Think about this one. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. You think he's going to come back and bother you again? Well, sure he is. As long as we're on this earth, that problem won't end. Christ was tempted in all points, just like we are. He understands what we went through, what we go through. He understands it all because he was human. Romans chapter 8, I'm going to go back there and finish up. You go back with me to Romans chapter 8. The Holy Spirit helps us in our time of weakness. Likewise, the Spirit in verse 26, with Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for. 
as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be under, uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, and because he makes intercession for the st saints according to God's will. You know, sometimes we don't even know what to pray for. Have you ever been in that situation? You don't even know what to pray for. I don't even know, God, what do I ask you for? You know, sometimes I just say, Lord, just put your hand on this situation. Just put your hand on it. You know what we need, and you see all sides. Sometimes we've got to do that, and that's called faith. We've just got to put our faith in him. Verse 28 might be one of my favorite scriptures, at least in Romans. Romans 8, 28, you probably know it. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work for good. Even those things in our life that we don't understand. Even those situations that we can't quite figure out. I'll leave you with one last scripture this morning. If you go in that same chapter, Romans 8 to verse 37. This is how it ends. This is how it ends if you are in Christ. Romans 8 verse 37 and following. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors. Praise the Lord for that one. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul says, I am persuaded that neither life, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Satan's power is limited. He can't separate you from your Savior, even if he wanted to. Oh, he can bother you. He can pick on you. He can mess with you. But only you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and me, have the power to separate ourselves from Christ. Only within each of us lies the power to separate ourselves from Christ. And if you put on Christ and you make him your Savior, just like these five that we talked about in the last few days have done, you've taken that first step. But if you've never done that, I want you to listen to me now. If you've never made Christ your Savior, Satan ain't got to do nothing to you. He's already got you. Now maybe you say, well, preacher, that's kind of hard. I'm going to tell you something about the scriptures. The scriptures may hurt you with the truth, but they will never comfort you with a lie. God's word does not do that. And if you've never obeyed the gospel, you need to think about the temporary state of this life. You need to think about it real hard. We don't know how much time we've got. But we do know that when we step out into eternity, we're going to go one way or we're going to go the other. You have that choice. I can't do it for you. I can't make you do it. I can beg you, I can plead you, I can get out on my knees and beg you if you've never obeyed the gospel to do it. But I can't make you do it. That's up to you. I want you to think about that. And if you have a need this morning, won't you come as we...
sing that invitation song.